Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Michael here. Today, I'm going to show you how to manage rapid, lightning fast eye and face detection switching when shooting groups of people together. It's a little bit tricky if you do not know the custom setup. I have to give a huge shout out to Lucas Passmore, one of my longtime student and friends. These are his images. He's graciously let us use them. Lucas is a, amazing. If you shoot portrait and lifestyle, I would definitely recommend following him on his socials. He has a very unique style in, in the way that he shoots, his processing very, very high end, I'm very proud of him in, in the work that he's done. And the type of shooting that he does is very freestyle. It's very loose, it's very dynamic and fluid. And it's also usually involving multiple people. Eye and face detection with the R5 and R6 are just incredible game changers. If you've never used them as a portrait and wedding photographer, you, you get a higher percentage of keepers, which means your workflow and your, and your processing time uh, it becomes more efficient. Uh, all of these things are amazing. The problem comes when we have more than one person in the frame. So the question became from Lucas, and he asked the question on my Facebook group for the R5 and R6. If you guys haven't joined, check it out. We discuss these, these kinds of problems, and when there's a really good question, I'll make a video on it. So he went out and did a test shoot, and he was like, I'm having a really hard time directing eye detection quickly enough to capture the person I want. And so that is a fantastic question and I'm going to answer it here, show you how to set up your camera in a way that will manage it very quickly. This is going to involve some custom camera setup and then I'm going to demonstrate the techniques. There's a few parts of this to make it uh, make sense. It's going to take a little bit of practice and muscle memory, but once you get the hang of it, it I mean, we're talking lightning fast. Also what you can do when things go wrong. So first let's talk about the customization of the camera itself. We're going to toggle the info screen until we get to this black Q screen. We're gonna hit the Q button. And I'm going to demonstrate the settings that I have for this to work. Coming in to, we're gonna stay on the still side and I'm gonna come down to the star button. It's a very popular place for people to customize eye and face detection right here. There is another one that sort of looks like eye detection that isn't. We don't want this one. We want the one that has eye AF. What that will do is that will force the camera to jump into eye detection mode directly as you are shooting. So you would push and hold and fire away. I know it maybe feel a little weird to do that, but trust me, this is gonna be amazing if we get this set up the right way. The next customization that I would highly, highly recommend is this guy right here depth of field preview button, and we want it on direct autofocus method selection. This is a fancy way of saying changing the focusing clusters. The depth of field preview button is the button on the inside of the camera where your right ring finger would rest. Another thing that we need to do is we need to come into page five of our purple tab, initial servo autofocus point for eye or face and tracking. Come in here, you want it on the middle setting. This isn't gonna work quite as well unless you have it on the middle setting. Uh, basically what this does is it tells the camera where to look if we are starting with a focusing point between our expanded areas and like our smaller focusing squares. We're telling the camera, hey, look here, when we jump into face detection and tracking. If we have it on auto, we're leaving that decision to the camera. If we have it on initial AF point, the camera is going to look where the focusing square was the last time you were in that cluster. So we're just gonna leave it here for now. And another thing that I want you to do is to come into page four, limit auto focus methods. We have these little check marks. You probably have meant more turned on and that's okay. What this does is it tells the camera to ignore certain focusing clusters and we're gonna turn off a couple of them. So we, I'm gonna keep the spot you can't turn off a single square. I'm gonna turn off this expanded five square and I'm going to leave on this expanded AF area around. I, I found it works really well with this area. And then I'm gonna turn off these last couple so you can turn them on and off. Absolutely make sure you hit and select okay, otherwise it will not save. Tapping my shutter button and coming back out, I am also going to make sure that I am on servo. It's not gonna work as well on one shot, 
In fact, for this type of shooting, I would recommend servo because it's dealing, we're dealing with motion and moving people. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be way better on servo. Now, once you get it set up the way you like, so you don't have to come in here and reset it up. If you do a different style of shooting, I did one for bird photography. Anyway, come in here, register settings to, let's say C1 would be your portrait mode, save it. That way, if you change some of these settings, if you need them for different styles, you can still always just come back in to your C1 and you know you're going to be good to go. And that, that'll remember the mode you're shooting in, pretty much everything. So now that we have it set up, I wanna demonstrate a couple things real quick before we get into the method and the technique. So I'm gonna cover the lens and I'm going to start pushing the depth of field preview button. And what this does is it allows us to cycle through the focusing clusters that we had checkmarked on that page five of our autofocus menu. You can see how fast I can jump through each of those clusters. This is going to save us if we get into a problem but for this demonstration, I'm going to start off with this expanded focus area cluster and uh, basically show you how it works. It's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool. Now, in the past, you would just hit eye detection, right? You were, we're engaging our eye detection and the camera is making the decision. But what this does is it allows us to put a focusing cluster over our target. So let's say we wanted to focus on the girl on the right, we would come over, have that focusing square on her face, and now engage eye detection. And you can see how quickly I can jump from face to face using this technique. It's lightning quick. And Lucas, this is gonna solve most of your problems. Even you got people with their face turned and maybe in the shadows, things of that nature. It's super quick and it works most of the time. The thing that's great about this particular method of doing it is that when you're using eye detection, I know it's kind of hard to see, but I can recompose my subject once I get that, that face lock. I can move the subject around anywhere, any way I want. So the question that's gonna happen is that you're gonna be shooting and your eye detection is not gonna work right. You're gonna to want to focus on her and the eye detection is gonna be jumping over here. I can't demonstrate it because it's working the way I want. So what do you do in those situations where eye detection is not engaging the way you want? I'm going to give you three different options right now. The first would just to be engage regular focus. So you can see the focus box on her face. Now the problem with this is that if I try to recompose, servo updates. And so it's gonna be re recomposing on her chin. And so unless it's composed the way you want, you might have to manage your focusing square and re-engage. The problem with this is that if you're dealing with very wide aperture lenses, you know, 1.8, 1.4, 1.2, you're really going to have to have precise focus on, on where you want it. And that is where the toggling of the focusing squares come in. So if there was a very particular way I wanted to compose her, I could get there. It's gonna take maybe a second or two. So that would be the second thing. Now, the reason why I like these methods is because, as you can see, I can jump back into my regular eye detection for the one shot that didn't work. And you can see I can, I can jump back and forth very quickly between those two. It's just that when we're not using eye detection, we're not able to recompose the way we would want to. So there is a third tweak to this, and it's not going to be for everybody, which is why I kind of left it out at the beginning, is that if we come back in to our button customizations, and we come back down to, in this case, I'm going to customize what is normally the cluster square selector to be the servo one shot button, basically allowing me to toggle back and forth between one shot and servo. Now, the reason why I want to do this, and I would resave it over if, if I wanted to keep this, I'd come back in here, I'd register settings, resave it over my C1. The reason why we want to do this is because if eye detection is failing and, and we need to recompose, we would hit this. Now we're in one shot, grab that focus lock, and then we can recompose. Now, obviously, it's not going to work with very wide aperture lenses, but now we have a few backups. And if we want to jump back into eye detection, we would hit that and we're back in the game. So we really have four different focusing methods and techniques that we can switch between just by pushing these three buttons in the depth of field preview, it is going to take some muscle memory, some practice to get used to it. We have our eye detection, we have regular focus, 
we can switch our focusing square and we can switch even to one shot where we get the green square and toggle all back to where we were just within a second. If you enjoyed this advanced tutorial, check out my R5 and R6 crash course. For those of you who have already purchased it, we will be adding it to the lessons. If you're brand new to either camera, check out the free YouTube video in the Facebook group. Thanks again to Lucas Passmore for the question, for the images. I, I love that we're able to contribute to the community and expand everybody's knowledge. Thank you guys for watching, and I will see you next time.